The Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Ott. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. During his lifetime, Idris Shah promoted contacts and connections between different traditions around the world, believing this to be an important element in the advancement of human culture. In this spirit, the Idris Shah Foundation has created Cultural Crossroads, a website forum where people from many walks of life are invited to talk about their own experiences crossing cultural boundaries and the lessons that they have learned as a result. You can find these articles on the ISF blog. This is our fifth Cultural Crossroads interview for this podcast. John Zade is a writer, photographer and author. His work has appeared in various magazines, newspapers and online publications, including The Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, The Guardian, The Telegraph, Travel and Leisure, BBC, CBC, Al Jazeera, New York Post, Explore, Masonerve, Monte Cristo, Los Angeles Review of Books, Toke and Canoe, and Canadian Business. He has also worked as a news writer and producer at CBC News Network and Al Jazeera English. John has recently completed his first book about Sasquatch law in Canada's Great Bear Rainforest. In the Valleys of the Noble Beyond in Search of the Sasquatch, is being published by Grove Atlantic in the US and Greystone Books in Canada in July 2019. The book is available for pre-order from Amazon.com. It's with great pleasure that I'm here to talk to John Zadda, former documentary maker, writer, journalist, brilliant photographer, and his new book, In the Valleys of the Noble Beyond, which is published by Grove Atlantic in July. The book is about an incredible and rather esoteric subject, the Sasquatch. And the Sasquatch, or Bigfoot, is a sort of the mythical giant beast that lives in North America, but maybe is related perhaps to the abominable snowman of the Himalayas. But John, tell us a bit about what the Sasquatch is. Yes, the Sasquatch... Um, is basically how you sort of generally describe it. It's a, it's a sort of a hybrid of man and ape, a kind of large uh, bipedal primate, which has been seen in different parts of North America, primarily uh, largely in the Pacific Northwest for um, centuries. Uh, reports dating back um, as far back as uh, colonial times. Um, the indigenous people of, of the continent have stories going back similarly centuries and these sightings and these encounters continue to this day and what people tend to see is and often by by accident or in in an unplanned way is basically kind of these tall shaggy bulky large sort of humanoids who um either you know step out from the forest or they cross the road while people are driving or you know, come up to a person's home often in the middle of the night. They, 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 they're sort of described as, as, as nocturnal beings. And just as the kind of moment of, of, of shock begins to wear off in the few seconds that take place during the encounter, the, the creatures tend to run off or disappear or the, the, the eyewitnesses, you know, tends to be kind of left with a big question of what they actually saw. And so there are, there are decades and decades and decades of these, of these sightings and, um, Science has sort of rejected the notion that there are these sort of creatures or animals because, of course, no sort of body has been produced or any kind of physical evidence. So it's kind of taken on the the proportions of a modern sort of contemporary myth uh, where you've got, you know, thousands of people across the continent who claim that, yes, we've actually seen these things. They exist. They're intelligent. They're elusive. They, uh, they, they live in sort of the, the, the more inaccessible or remote parts of the continent. And then you have generally both science and I guess probably the, the vast majority of urban populations kind of seeing it as, as a kind of either a, a mix of a hoax or um, a myth or hallucination. And so the whole topic sort of constitutes huge mystery. And so I was drawn to this topic, uh, having read about it, from when I was a child and and wanting to kind of make sense of it and understand, well, what what is actually going on here? And um, 
so this yeah. is something you've 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 had sort of bubbling away for for years presumably when you you went looking for sasquatch and sasquatch stories you identified an area that is the most likely place the, the place richest in stories where, where would that be the Pacific Northwest, sort of the area comprising British Columbia, Washington State, Oregon, Northern California, maybe little sort of bits of Idaho, like that sort of whole area there has sort of been the, the traditional region where, where people tend to associate the Sasquatch with the most because it's incredibly mountainous, it's remote, it's forested, because it's sort of the last areas being on the Pacific coast where colonial settlers kind of moved into towards the end, it's, it's, it's sort of the least sort of developed. And so um, as a kid growing up, when I read those sort of early books about the Sasquatch, there was a lot of focus on British Columbia because one of the main researchers, a guy by the name of John Green, lived in British Columbia and he sort of spent a lot of time digging up accounts and stories in that area. And so for me, I've always had an incredible amount of interest in that area. So um, I identified one region in particular, which is sort of the central and north coast of, of British Columbia, where uh, you have towns and villages like Bella Bella and Bella Coola, Klemtu. And so this particular region is sort of known by some people as the Great Bear Rainforest, which is uh, an area of, of coastal temperate rainforest that extends from around the north tip of Vancouver Island along the mainland coast and the islands abutting it all the way up to the Alaska Panhandle. It, it, it is it is perhaps one of one of the most intact forest regions in the entire world. And so my sense was that if there is an undiscovered primate, an, an elusive one that is largely trying to live a kind of hidden life away from problematic and dangerous humans, there would perhaps be a kind of uh, a density or a cluster of the creatures in this in this area. And so um that combined with my interest in the era, going back to the books that I read in childhood, sort of led me back there. And I figured this would be a really, really, really great place to go and talk to the people and hear their stories and, in a sense, kind of take on a, take on a sort of a quest for the book in an attempt to kind of try and perhaps see one for myself. How open-minded were you? In order to kind of really delve into the subject properly, you you have to be very open-minded in a sense. You have to, you know, let your imagine, imagination run wild. You have to open up to possibility and, and, in a sense, you know, suspend disbelief. And because I'm also approaching it as a journalist, there is a kind of another kind of approach that runs parallel to that where I'm sort of investigating and I'm collecting stories and I'm talking to people. But unless you are going out in an attempt to deliberately and consciously debunk, you kind of have to court both mentalities simultaneously and... And because I did have that childhood obsession, <clears throat> I thought for the purposes of the story, it would also be great to, to kind of let that aspect run sort of wild in a way, kind of just sort of go with the flow, basically. Because in a way, if, if you approach it too rigidly, you're not really going to get the stories. You're not really going to get people to talk to you. You're, you're also not going to kind of access the spirit of the place and the spirit of the subject, which, which I think is what you're trying to tap into when you delve deeper into the subject. So who have the stories? Who did you find who has seen Sasquatch? As I traveled between the different communities in the area, there were a number of people in each town or in village who had seen them or who, who had a relative who'd seen them. And I was actually expecting that it would be really difficult to find people who I had either seen them or who would be willing to talk about it. But what ended up happening was um, they came out of the woodwork. They wanted to tell their stories they wanted to share their experiences because I think some of them were so convinced by what they had seen. And these are people, mind you, that like they know all the forest animals. They're kind of out on the land all the time. They, they see bears frequently. So they're not kind of city people who just, you know, they go camping or they go hiking and they're kind of easily frightened or scared by sort of bumps in the night kind of thing. I mean, these, these are people who have a very good knowledge of the area. And so they were young people. They were older people. They were elders. They were... Um, came from all sort of backgrounds and um, even non-Indigenous people because there are communities up there that are also non-Indigenous. So it's, it was a bit of both. And not everybody were convinced of their existence or are convinced of their existence. Some people, even within the Indigenous communities, don't see the creature as, as necessarily um, existing in the, in, in the sense that others do. But what function do you think does the Sasquatch play for 
indigenous people because it is originally an indigenous mythological or, or even real creature, isn't it? Different indigenous groups see the Sasquatch or, or the creature we call the Sasquatch a bit differently. There isn't really one sort of blanket sort of view or attitude or, or, or belief about the creatures. But I mean, if we look at the areas that I traveled in on, on the coast, I mean, generally speaking, the consensus is that the Sasquatch is a, considered a sort of uh, a steward or a caretaker of, of the land, a kind of nature being who kind of looks over the ecosystem, let's say. And, and so that is, in a sense, one kind of function. But these sorts of wild people creatures kind of have another function that they are characters in, in traditions and in stories. Um, and they can be either benevolent or they can be malign. And I think that, like, I mean, for instance, like one of the best known stories that go back in sort of in time for some groups, the, the Sasquatch is known as the, as the Junaquat. It's a kind of malign woman of the woods who kidnaps children and places them, you know, in her basket and she, she takes them back into her lair and eats them. And those stories have tended to kind of um, serve as reminders, I guess, in the past for sort of children to not, you know, wander too far into the, into the woods and to kind of stay close within the community and everything. And, I, and, and those stories are still told, you know, to this day and everything. And, and among other groups, you know, these creatures are a, a kind of a blessing or for others yet they kind of see it as a sign that, that there's a lesson to impart in its in, in its encounter and and so I, I think there's kind of a lot of meaning built into the creatures and so um even though there is perhaps an acknowledgement that the creatures exist in some kind of physical form in addition to perhaps even a, a supernatural form there's lots of meaning bound up do, bound do, up in do the, these do the um, native people believe you have to be in a certain state to see the creature in a kind of blessed state or something like that when you see one there's a reason for seeing it and you can't really go out in search of it just to see it for the sake of seeing it which then sort of i guess ties into to explanations as to why those who are you know the non-indigenous people who tend to go hunting for it never see it but i think there, there tends to be a reason why and the reason could be is tied to one's inner state and and what one is grappling with at that certain point in their life and so, um, yes, there does tend to be a kind of a correlation between having an encounter with one of these creatures and th there being some, some connection to what is, what is owing or due to you in, in your own life and, and, and what you need to do or avoid or learn or one sort of, I guess, process of inner development is somehow tied with seeing one of these things. Okay. Some countries are more mysterious than others. In other words... You, you definitely feel, and it may simply be because everybody believes more superstitious stuff, you definitely believe there's, there's something in the air. Did you find that with this area of Canada? Was it like that? So like being in India or, 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 or somewhere, you know, you know, the Moroccan mountains or something? Was there, was there some kind of sense of mystery there as well? You know, when I took on the project, it sort of came on the heels of a lot of time spent abroad, particularly in the Middle East, a lot of travel to various foreign destinations that you know had their own sort of exoticism and mystique and, and, and the whole thing. And, and I, I had hit the wall and had a great deal of, of fatigue with, with that sort of travel. And so I, I really kind of wanted to kind of ex explore Canada and, and, and sort of uh, see a bit more of my own country. And so we, when we talk about our countries, we talk about these sort of finite geographical entities and in, in some cases for some people they're fairly small and sort of homogeneous both in sort of their like populations and, and, and their their topography but because Canada is so vast and massive when you travel from one part to the other it really is kind of like you're, you're crossing a continent so you are it is like going to uh, a foreign place in, in, in many instances even though people speak the same language and you're kind of bound by similar culture and everything but yes to answer the question directly like when I spent all this time on the West Coast, it was very much like being in a, in a place which was so totally, totally different from the environment that I'm used to. I mean, I grew up in a big city, Toronto. It's sort of miniature version of New York. It's a kind of a concrete jungle. And, and then suddenly I find myself in this, in this place of like incredible nature mountains and lakes and rivers and like almost it's almost like infinite in its vastness and 
and these very small communities where everybody knows each other and it's quiet and uh, just just a kind of sense of community and, and kinship. And it was very different than anything I'd ever experienced before. And it was very much like going to w what people would describe as like another country or like a foreign environment. And that's why I think when I speak to people who, who, are, who are sort of let's say, like, highly, highly skeptical of something like the Sasquatch, and myself being, you know, somewhat more open-minded, like, I, I tell them, like, if you ever go to these places and, and see them for yourself and spend time in them, the, your perception of what is possible changes to some degree, right? It's It's yeah. like... You can almost see there being something like this there. And so, and I think that's what made the journey largely what it was for me in that, you know, had I gone to some other place that was maybe like less wild and, 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 and not as kind of almost existing in another dimension almost, it, it would be almost sort of harder to kind of imagine it. Have you changed in your, in your belief in the Sasquatch? Or is that, is that the wrong question? I don't know. Have you changed? Do you believe more than when you yeah, set out? yeah. I would say my, my position, ha, you know, fundamentally hasn't changed. I think it sort of moved back and forth over the course of the travels and the writing of the book. And, and what really, I, I would say the more important question is, like, what was it that I kind of learned about the, the whole subject? And I, and I think for me, it, the, the sort of the big takeaway was that it isn't really about does the Sasquatch exist or not exist, even though that is a compelling and to some a very interesting and, and, and important question. But I think for me, it, it's if you stay locked onto that, to that sort of um, dualistic sort of approach of like exist versus doesn't exist, or, you know, that sort of black versus white either or approach, it's a bit of a more of an impoverished kind of take on the SAS, which I think the more important take is like, what does it mean? And like, what is the significance of it as a symbol? What does it tell us about ourselves? And I think there was a certain point in the journey when I kind of was going back and forth and back and forth and, you know, between like almost being convinced that they exist to kind of saying, well, no, maybe they, they maybe they really don't exist. And, and you, you kind of reach this kind of almost like loggerhead where unless you see one for yourself and are convinced of their existence, you can't really say with any, any certainty. So I, I decided to kind of to, to steer the investigation in, in a completely different direction and explore the significance of the Sasquatch. And so that's the direction it goes, sort of from the sort of, I would say, the midpoint onwards. And even though I remain open to it, um, I think that's kind of where the real kind of discussion lies. Okay. So taking a very different take, because because the obvious sort of journalistic angle is it's there or it isn't there, to, to sort of go for a more nuanced approach seems like well definitely the most interesting the approach to take as a culture we we feel obligated to with any issue with any question with any with any kind of debate to kind of fall on one side or the other and even if we don't have the full knowledge even if many of us are just opinion mongers you know you don't have to choose a side necessarily and especially if you don't know and i think people have a really hard time with uncertainty and they have to fall on one side uh, or the other of any debate, including including this one. And also, too, like some questions, just they don't have an answer, right? And so um, when you kind of delve deep enough into this subject and into this issue, it does take on the dimensions of a, of a true, true mystery. So why not just kind of like sidestep the whole issue of exist versus not exist and just kind of court all the possibility and explore them all and kind of enjoy the whole ride? The subject is, is profoundly rich and pregnant with possibility in terms of what it can tell us about ourselves. And I, and I think if you just look at the, the huge amount of interest in the subject and the large numbers of people who are actively investigating and seeking out the Sasquatch and looking for it, and I mean, like, just looking at, like, the question of why do we pursue the creature, in a sense, and, and, and there, there's loads there. I mean, it, it stems from anything from our interest in adventure to um, questing journeys to going on missions to exploring new terrain and, and, and delving into the unknown to, um, you know, seeking a deeper connection with nature. I mean, the Sasquatch can be seen as a personification of the wilder parts of humanity that have been tamed since we've, you know, built cities and kind of lived in civilizations. I mean, in a sense, we seek to reconnect with that sort of long forgotten part of us. I mean, other people pursue the Sasquatch probably for 
reasons of um, going out into the forest at night and wanting to be frightened, wanting to be scared, wanting to have that sense of excitement, that sort of brush with death when they hear something moving through the forest at night. And, and you know, you even go deeper a little bit and, and just even, you know, see the whole interest in the pursuit of the Sasquatch as something almost quasi-religious. Like, I think, you know, we seek to connect with like a being of, of higher intelligence, a, a demigod or you know, a superhuman entity even. I mean, if, if you know, you know enough about these creatures, I mean, they're, they're reported to be intelligent, you know, elusive, powerful, swift, almost like magical in a sense. And so I think that at a very deep level, even though a Sasquatch enthusiast or a Sasquatch investigator can say, oh, you know, I'm trying to, you know, discover something for the sake of science or I'm wanting to kind of like add to like the knowledge of humanity by kind of finding these things, like, Maybe really deep down, like that person, they may not be religious people per se, but maybe some part of themselves is kind of looking to to connect with this thing that lives out there, and and, and that that may represent a kind of a, a metaphysical or a mystical or a kind of entity which which represents a realm that is beyond our own mundane physical existence, let's say, and so the subject can be can be approached from so many angles. And so I think going back to this question of does it exist, doesn't it exist, I mean, you can just see how limiting that question is as opposed to what does a Sasquatch tell us about us? That's it. I mean, I guess that's the noble beyond of the, of the title, that uh, that's what you're taking us to, to consider. And um, that, That's exactly one of the meanings of the, of the title. So I really want to thank you, John. It's an absolutely fascinating subject. I'm sure we could keep talking about that for a very long time, but obviously far more in the book, in the valleys of the noble beyond. John Zadda, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rob. This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.